All right, guys, the time has come. We have to do this after seven years of talking about motorcycle squids on the channel. It's time to recognize that there is a whole category of motorcyclists who make the average street squid look like a toddler on a tricycle who's buzzing from one too many baby bottle pops. I am, of course, talking about motorcycle stunt riders. We have a bit of a checkered past with stunt riders. I may have said some things about them in the past. I may have had the whole city of Chicago angry at me one time because I said that I don't think that there should be a thousand people doing wheelies on the street at the same time. I think it's super annoying. But today we're going to try talking about this in the most reasonable way possible. What could go wrong? Riders have been performing stunts and the first motorcyclists crawled out of the ocean, but it was a gradual evolution from the time of Jedediah Cumberland pumping a milk crate on his rickety Indian 4 in 1928 to the 12 o'clock boys becoming public enemy number one for riding dirt bikes and ATVs on the freeways of Baltimore. So today, we're going to look at the evolution of motorcycle stunt culture, the types of bikes stunt riders ride, and pretty much everything you need to know to elevate your reckless behavior from baby squid to seasoned stunt samurai. So sit back, relax, maybe crack open a cold, refreshing energy drink or inhale a balloon full of NOS and prepare yourself for some dank nooners and Hayabusa hand drag on today's episode of Yammy Noob. This video is sponsored by our friends over at Chin Mounts. I will tell you more about them later on in the video. Let's get into it. In the most basic sense, motorcycle stunt riding refers to performing extreme maneuvers on your bike that defy the way a motorcycle is typically ridden. I know it's a bit vague, but stick with me. For as long as people have been riding motorcycles, they likely were performing stunts as well. Early motorcycle risk takers would do stunts on primitive motorcycles like rudimentary wheelies or jumps. Early stunt riding relied much more more heavily on ramps or other contraptions as the bike themselves were not powerful enough to do much of anything on their own. Can you imagine what it was like being the first guy to wheelie a bicycle or to wheelie a motorcycle? It probably felt amazing. Early stunt riders were often exclusive to fairs or circuses when professionals would do choreographed performances that included riding motorcycles off of jumps or inside the notorious Globe of Death. The Globe of Death is the recognizable big mesh sphere where riders defy gravity through centrifugal force. There have actually been many instances of rider death during these performances and the Ringling Bros actually rebranded it to the Globe of Steel in an attempt to skirt any negative connotation. So. Globe of death, literally globe of death. During this early era of motorcycle stunts, there were also the Royal Signals Motorcycle Display Team, also known as the White Helmets, comprised of active members of the Royal Army who did choreographed routines of bizarre and acrobatic stunts, like building a human pyramid of 15 riders across five motorcycles. I think it's safe to say the earliest version of motorcycle stunt riding relied more on hokey novelty and choreography than being a skilled motorcyclist. This era was more in line with live performances than a culture that existed within the motorcycling populace. In the 60s and 70s, Evil Knievel was the most iconic motorcycle stunt performer and became one of the biggest cultural figures in motorcycling. He gained widespread frame and notoriety for his extreme motorcycle jumps and stunts. He began his career by performing smaller scale stunts at local events and quickly captured the public's attention with his tenacity. One of his earliest successes came in 1965 when he successfully jumped over a line of cars at the Idaho State Fair. Fair. However, it was Knievel's highly publicized stunts during the late 60s and early 70s that turned him into a cultural phenomenon. He attempted to jump over numerous vehicles, including cars, buses, and even trucks. Some of his most famous jumps include the Caesars Palace Fountain Jump in Las Vegas and the Snake River Canyon Jump in Idaho. Although not all of his jumps were successful, his determination and showmanship captivated audiences worldwide. Despite retiring from stunts in the early 1980s, his influence on motorcycle stunt riding culture and extreme sports is clear. Also, let's just take a doff of the cap off to recognize the fact that the dude was doing these like 100 and 200 foot jumps with like 1960s suspension and like a standard bike that weighed like 400 pounds. It's crazy. By the 80s, motorcycles were becoming far more powerful and technologically advanced. Not only were manufacturers squeezing more and more power out of four-cylinder engines, bikes were also getting lighter, brakes were getting better, and suspension was capable of handling more aggressive riding behavior. With the improvement in motorcycle capability, motorcycle stunts were no longer exclusive to huge productions for professional daredevils, and an increased popularity in urban freestyle stunt riding grew. This style of riding relied far less on jumps or carefully choreographed performance, but instead was about 
pushing a motorcycle and your ability as a rider to the limits while still maintaining control of your bike. This led to the style of stunt riding that we know today, where maneuvers such as wheelies, rolling burnouts, stoppies, and drifting are all common. Now you better believe if you're gonna be out there risking life and limb doing dank nooners or some wicked burnouts on your motorcycle, you better get some documentation to prove it. Picks or it didn't happen, right? That's where the sponsor of today's video comes into play, Chin Mounts. Chin Mounts make the best action camera mounting system for motorcycle helmets. We use them on our helmets here at Yami Noob. And trust me guys, they are leaps and bounds better than the generic mounts that your camera comes with. Chin Mounts makes mounts that are specifically designed to retain the functionality on over 300 different helmets and they will mount up perfectly. The chin mount system also allows you to mount your camera vertically so your videos are perfectly formatted for social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok. Chin mounts are compatible with GoPro cameras, Insta360, and more. With mounts for over 300 specific helmets, you're bound to find a perfect one for your setup. And because you're a loyal Yami Noob viewer, you can go to chinmounts.com slash Yami and use the code Yami for 10% off of your order. Again, that's Yami for 10% off your whole order. Thanks again to Chin Mounts for supporting the channel. Be sure to check out that link in the description below. Now back to the video. And just like that, the 90s and early 2000s came and extreme sports and motorcycle stunt riding included became wildly popular. Everything was getting extreme in the Y2K era. This was my childhood and it was so much fun. Ketchup was purple, everything was covered in slime, and ESPN beamed the X Games into the eyeballs of viewers worldwide. I used to skateboard when I was a kid. I was pretty decent at it. It was a lot of fun. This era led to the way of beginning of freestyle motocross, an offshoot of motorcycling that would grow to a massive scope thanks to riders like Travis Pastrana, whose otherworldly talent for extreme feats has taken him far beyond his double backflip at the X Games in 2006. Sport bikes and motorcycle racing were also reaching their peak in popularity in the mid-2000s, so together they were united with the culture of extreme sports and stunt riding began to look a lot like it does today. Like I mentioned, modern motorcycle stunt riding involves different maneuvers that showcase the rider's control over the motorcycle. Now, here are some common moves that stunt riders do. There are, of course, wheelies. I'd say just about everyone knows what a wheelie is, with many average Joes having popped up the front wheel on their mongoose a time or two in their youth, but it takes a very skilled operator to wheelie properly on a motorcycle. If you have a super powerful motorcycle, it's easy enough to power wheelie by whacking the throttle open and lifting the front but a wheelie done by a stunt rider is much more involved than that. Stunt riders are capable of doing what's called a balance point wheelie. Jixerbrock came by the shop recently and taught me a thing or two about reaching balance point on a motorcycle. Had a lot of fun and I really wanna get a little bike to practice now. But for this type of wheelie, you aren't just relying on the power of the motorcycle and chasing out a wheelie as you increase in speed, which is what I do. A balance point wheelie is about control and manipulating the clutch, throttle, and rear brake to be able to lean all the way back to balance point where the bike is nearly tipping over. A masterful stunt rider is able to do this at slower speeds, carefully resting at 12 o'clock balance point. This is where the slang terms like dank nooners come from. This control during balance point wheelies is the foundation of many other maneuvers stunt riders do like circle wheelies, hand drags, and other variations. Circle wheelies are pretty self-explanatory. They're a controlled balance point wheelie where the rider rides in a tight circle. These are often done in conjunction with other tricks like the high chair or the spreader where the rider sits on the gas tank with either their feet above the handlebars or extending out sideways. Another common move for stunt riders is the stoppy. To do a stoppy, a rider uses the momentum and braking force to lift the rear wheel during deceleration. Stunt riders also do drifts and rolling burnouts where traction is intentionally lost at the rear wheel, but the rider is still able to move the bike forward and side to side. So I I know there are many burgeoning street squids watching this video thinking, well, I can do all this stuff on my bone stock 600 with the muffler chopped off. Can I put on a clinic for the retirees in my parents' gated community? Outside of very rudimentary wheelies, your stunt performing capability will be highly limited on a stock motorcycle. Also as a side note, this stuff is super duper hard and really dangerous. So if you're thinking about going out there and trying to stop you into a crazy like, you know, three point turn and do a drift into a wheelie, Dude, it's so hard. Just take it easy, learn it slow if you wanna learn stunting. It's extremely difficult to do any of this stuff. And it starts to blend the line between like enduro and trials contests. I don't know, it's all like related a little bit, but you'll see. In the stunt scene, there are a few different style of motorcycles people use for stunt bikes. The most
capable bikes seem to be highly modified 600 class bikes from the early 2000s. Some popular examples are the Kawasaki ZX6R and Honda CBR 600 F4i, kind of the cream of the crop. No matter how built up your bike is, if you're gonna stunt, you're gonna want a stunt cage. If you're stunting your bike, it's gonna get dropped, especially as you're learning. So the stunt cage, like other engine guards or crash protection, will protect your bike's vulnerable components in the event of a low speed drop. But just like other motorcycle crash protection, they're not gonna do much as far as preventing damage during 186 mile per hour highway pull gone wrong. But luckily, stunt bikes usually have a huge rear sprocket that makes it easier for low speed maneuvers at the detriment of top speed. Pretty much, you can think of it as like the most skilled stunting happens at the slowest speeds. Doing a wheelie at like two miles per hour on a 600 is ridiculously hard. Another feature that makes stunt bikes pretty distinguishable from traditional motorcycles is the use of a scooped gas tank. These gas tanks are sculpted inward on top and meant to gently hold your rear end in place during moves like the high chair where you're doing a wheelie and you jump on the gas tank. Stunt bikes also have a second brake lever so the rider's able to control the rear brake with their hand. This becomes a crucial component when you realize just how often a stunt rider is in a position that takes their right foot away from the rear brake lever. And as we discussed earlier, rear brake control is a necessity for wheelies, as a quick tap of the brake can bring your front end back down when you tip over too far and you feel your stomach drop as you're about to loop out. This extra brake lever controls an added brake caliper on the rear brake disc. It might look strange to the average motorcyclist, but most stunt bikes you see will have four brake calipers in total. One for each of the two discs in the front and two on the single disc in the rear with each being operated independently by their corresponding lever. A motorcycle built for stunt riding will also have the clip-ons replaced with traditional handlebars raised to the height to allow for more control and leverage. And lastly, stunt bikes also have a huge rear sprocket, usually. Larger rear sprockets increase the torque applied to the rear wheel. This allows stunt riders to manipulate the throttle more effectively and generate more power for performing stunts such as wheelies, drifts, and burnouts. Stunt riding also often involves performing maneuvers at low speeds, requiring precise control over the bike's power delivery. The larger rear sprockets allows the rider to maintain better control and achieve smoother throttle modulation during slow speed stunts. 600cc sport bikes aren't the only motorcycle stunt riders use though. There's a whole subcategory of motorcycle stunt riders who specifically ride Harley Davidsons, including old Dyna models, sportsters, and even big touring baggers. The riders that stunt Harley Davidsons have their own specific modifications and riding style as you are more limited on what stunts you can do on a 6 to 800 pound cruiser compared to a 400 pound sport bike. Harley Davidson motorcycles that are used for stunt riding have modifications done to the suspension both front and rear. The rear shocks are replaced with longer ones that increase the ride height and travel and the front forks are rebuilt with aftermarket springs and cartridges that are better equipped to handle coming down from wheelies. They usually have tall flat handlebars for better control and leverage. Many Harley Davidson engines also need modification or relocation of the oil pickup tube to avoid oil starvation while up at balance point for a prolonged period of time. These bikes usually have aftermarket clutch packs and change drive conversion kits as the OEM clutch and drive belt usually wear out under the stress of burnouts and wheelies. People in the stunt community also ride mini bikes like Groms or Honda Monkeys and that are usually modified in the same way a sport bike is to be capable of stunt riding. There are usually supermotos and dirt bikes in the stunt riding crowd as the lightweight and playful nature lends themselves to that style of riding. Motorcycle stunt culture has grown in popularity thanks to the internet where communities of riders share their bike builds and release photos and videos of their stunts. Groups like Unknown Industries started putting out raw videos of them ripping fast wheelies on Harleys in the early 2000s and have since grown to have a huge fan based big brand sponsorships and their own product lines. Stunt riding has always had a huge community often revolving around massive urban group rides. These rides have become notorious in some cities like Chicago and Los Angeles where riders turn out in the hundreds. These huge groups rides have made way for other recognizable bands of stunt riders like the 12 o'clock boys in Baltimore who are the subject of their entire feature length documentary. And while stunt riding has always had sort of an outlaw underground feeling to it, it has been adopted commercially as well. Most motorcycle events and rallies like Sturgis or Daytona Bike Week will have sponsored stunt riding contests, usually kind of cordoned off in a square. Even manufacturers or brands that operate within the extreme sports realms have sponsored stunt riders like Aaron Colton who rides for Red Bull or Rock Bagaros who rides for KTM. Another one of the most commercially successful motorcycle stunt riders is Sarah Lacido who not only competes as a rider but has also been successful as a motorcycle stunt double in movies, most notably acting as Scarlett Johansson's double in Marvel movies. Motorcycle stunt riding has come a long way since the days of carnies conquering the globe of death or evil Knievel jumping over some school buses. As motorcycle tech has advanced in 
and start riding culture has grown online and in city streets, always pushing the boundaries of what's possible with a motorcycle. This specific niche within motorcycling has made way for tons of talented riders to explore motorcycling in a creative way. Whether you love it or you hate it, there is no denying the skill and testicular fortitude it takes for a rider to accomplish these feats, especially when the stunts are done so on city streets while bobbing and weaving between cars, which I really don't recommend and I do think is pretty dangerous. But it's one thing for a rider to perform some stunts in an enclosed area during a motorcycle rally, but some of these urban stunt riders are just on a whole other level when stunt riding meets street squidding. But hey, a squid's gonna squid. I'm just here to bask in the glory and talk about it on the internet. And until I've mastered hand drags and high chairs in the Kawasaki H2, I've got no room to criticize. What do you guys think about stunt riding? Are you morally opposed to these extreme troublemakers or do you find it fascinating? I think it's a weird off branch of motorcycle subcultures. It's very similar to skateboarding or BMXing. It's a creative way and an artistic way to meld sports and extreme things. I think it's really cool. Thanks for watching all the way to the end and thanks again to Chin Mounts for sponsoring today's video. We'll catch you in the next one. Fact. People in Las Vegas consume more shellfish in a day than the entire country does in a year. Goodbye. Oh man. Oh, I gotta win this race. Oh. Oh. Oh, I better keep watching Yammy New. Oh man. Oh. Ah. Oh no. Ah. Oh, I can't see. I can't see. Ah.